It's a pleasant and popular myth that since 1066, no one's ever had the temerity to attack our little island fortress. Except the two little corporals, Adolf and Napoleon, and we gave them the about face in no uncertain terms. But it's simply not true. All sorts of people, for all sorts of reasons, have taken a slap at us over the years. You know, the Elizabethans always kept a close watch on the narrow seas. Because throughout the late 1500s, they were under the almost constant threat of a Spanish invasion. His most sacred, his most Catholic Imperial Majesty, King Philip of Spain, dreamed of bringing England's heretic queen to a due and proper obedience to His Holiness the Pope. The Spaniards had the finest, most ferocious professional troops in the whole of Europe. And what did we have? The Elizabethan militia. Poorly armed, badly trained, but with more bounce than the Harlem Globetrotters. To hear them talk, the Don would rue the day they ever set foot in England. But luckily for the Elizabethan militia, the fleet made sure that the Spaniards never did land in 1588. Because if they had, our friends here would have discovered that up against real troops, they'd have been about as much use as a chocolate teapot. Elizabeth kept her militia short of powder and armor and weapons. What it all meant in practice was that places like the unprotected harbors along the south coast of Cornwall were wide open to a Spanish raid. Places like Mounts Bay were living on borrowed time. On the morning of July the 23rd, 1595, the sea here then was a flat calm. Tiny wavelets came sluggish and slow out of a, a thick, dense white mist that covered the whole of the bay. Nobody in the village saw the four galleys that slid in out of the mist towards the beach. Nobody saw the red and the gold pennons that streamed and dipped at the mastheads. And nobody saw the surly black and bronze snouts of the culverins that the gunners ranged in on the houses. Nobody saw, but everybody heard. They all heard that first heart-thumping crash as the Spaniards fired their first salvo into the houses. Because on that sunny, unsuspecting morning, the Spaniards came to Mausel. The Spanish galleys stood off the beach and began to bombard the town for several hours. Now, normally, Spanish gunners were about as handy as a two-short plank, but on this occasion, well, even they couldn't miss a hillside full of houses. While the terrified townspeople streamed off into the surrounding countryside, the Spanish gunners made great sport and play of their work. And let's be honest, <laughs> it must have been terrific fun. Of course, the village was already in fire. The cannonballs had gone through thatch, gone through windows. Cooking fires had caught the thatch and things. And the actual Spanish troops marched into the village and they were very surprised that they actually found no resistance at all. Because Mausel actually was a tiny, poor village with no gun emplacements, no cannons, no, no, no militia, no nothing defending it. So in effect, they landed on the western horn of Mounts Bay, which was totally undefended. The heavy bombardment by the galleys drove away all the villagers except one man. This was Jenkin Kegwin, who was the village headman, uh, the most important man in the village. And he stood here with drawn sword, according to legend, daring the Spanish raiders to come farther. It was a very brave thing to do. I personally wouldn't have stood in front of the Spanish raid, but he dared them, and for his pains, he was killed. A Milanese arquebusier fired at him, almost at point-blank range, and the ball passed through him and embedded itself in the door. And according to local legend, the musket ball remained embedded in the door as a kind of trophy. Having destroyed Mausel, the galley squadron moved around into Newland. And encountering no more resistance there than they had here, they burned Newland. 
and moved on towards Penzance. The Cornish fled because they couldn't face up to the Spanish troops, and so the whole town was at the mercy of the raiders. And of course, they burned the town. They marched down through Chapel Street, which in those days was known as Our Lady Street, and admired these beautiful houses before they torched them. They burned the ships in the harbour. They held mass on the beach. They stole the great bronze gun from Henry VIII's battery at the Barbican. They effectively held a piece of Queen Elizabeth's realm for three days, which was more than the Great Armada ever achieved. Such was the impact of the raid, was that it took three days for Queen Elizabeth's courtiers to actually summon up the carriage to tell her that the Spanish had been ashore and had burned three towns in her realm. War's always a vile and vicious business, but the minute you bring religion into the equation, it really does go from bad to worse. Spanish Catholics and English Protestants hated each other with all the fear and loathing of happy little fundamentalists. That's why this church carries to this day the scarred, soot-black scorching of a blaze that the raiders started to demonstrate their abhorrence of the English and their heretic Protestant religion. I'd very much like, if I might at this juncture, to quote the inspirationally incisive work of the famous English historian Edmund Blackadder, who said that being cold was God's way of telling the Spaniards to burn more Protestant churches, ideally with their heretical English congregations still stuck inside them. So, imagine their surprise and delight when the Spaniards toiled up the hill to Paul and discovered the church packed full of the local congregation. It was the work of moments to dispatch a troop of horse off into the countryside in search of a garage that was open where they could buy some paraffin. The officers got their flint and tinder together, ready to start the blaze, and the sailors went back down to the beach and brought up bottles of sangria and the makings of a really good paella. They decided that after the battle, they were going to party. They were going to have a barbie, ideally with English Protestants on the menu. Fortunately, someone with a tad more common humanity than fanatical religious zeal decided to let the terrified villagers flee into the countryside. But the church wasn't going to be quite so lucky. After three nightmare days, the Don sailed out of Mounts Bay, and Mausel, Newlyn, and Penzance were left a smug blackened desolation. But within the year, we had our revenge, because the Queen sent the fleet against Spain, and the men of Mausel, and Newlyn, and Penzance took fire and steel to the Spaniard in his home. They went to Cadiz, the great seaport of Cadiz, and they raised it to the ground. Do to yeah, Good, eh? A hundred years after the Spanish raids on Cornwall, in one of history's little ironies, England, the most virulently anti-Catholic country in Europe, found herself actually ruled by a Catholic king. But most people had no intention of starting another long and bloody civil war just to get rid of him. They were realists. But for some men, their dreams are their only reality. On the 11th day of June in the year of our Lord, 1685, and the first year of the reign of His Gracious Majesty, King James II, an invasion fleet came here into Lyme Bay. They made the long tack in under the sheltering cliffs to land an army, an army who had one intention, to take the Catholic king from his throne and replace him with a Protestant monarch, the Duke of Monmouth. As 
As Monmouth came ashore, the first thing he did was to sink to his knees in prayer. And God knows he needed to pray, because his army was nothing more than 83 men. A rag, tag and bobtail outfit of cautious, hard-bitten mercenaries and madcap, hair-brained courtiers who spent all their time in Holland filling Monmouth's head full of crazy schemes. And when he got here, his pockets were empty. Oh, and trust me, even an army doesn't go far without money in its coffers. But Monmouth was rich in dreams. The sort of sweet, tantalizing dreams that if a man only holds on to them and believes in them enough, will take him out to his heart's desire. Or to his utter destruction. At least one chap tried to do his duty by King James and organize at least some show of resistance to the invaders. He ran up and down the cob cursing and stamping as he tried to persuade someone, anyone, to open fire on the invading ships. But true to the tradition of the local militia, they couldn't find the matches or the man with the key to the gunpowder store was visiting his mum over in Sidmouth. Whatever, Monmouth came ashore totally unopposed. Now as more and more men rallied to Monmouth, he decided to leave Lyme behind him and to take his troops down along the coast to Bridport. And it was there that the first fighting of the campaign took place. Monmouth's rebels clashed with the local county militia. Now, these weren't full-time professional trained troops. They were very much part-time, untrained lads, farm boys, tradesmen, who had to constantly be reminded by their officers not to point loaded guns at one another because they went off and hurt people. And yet, up against these, Monmouth's rebels only just managed to win the battle. And worse still, Monmouth's precious, vaunted cavalry were about as much use as a three-legged horse. If Monmouth had took the trouble to stop and think about what was going on around him, then he'd have been sensible to head straight back here to Lyme and hop on the first boat back to Holland. But he was still dreaming, and he continued his march inland. He skirmished his way across country towards Bristol, frittering away his limited resources, fighting poxy little scraps with the county militia. Nobody who mattered, certainly not the gentry, were prepared to stick their neck out to join him. Leastways, not while he was rattling round the West Country like a pee on a drum. But let him take a major port like Bristol, and then he'd start to look less like a dreamer and more like a king. But it never happened. At Canesham, he came up against real soldiers for the first time. It was the turning point. He only lost 15 men, but he abandoned all hope of capturing Bristol because he'd lost his bottle. And worse still, he lost all credibility and he knew it too. Monmouth became depressed and distraught. His men were deeply dismayed. And as they scurried back to Bridgewater, the ones who hadn't deserted, all of them prayed for a miracle. It came on the evening of Sunday, July the 5th. The Royal Army camped in the fields around Western Zoyland. Observing them from St. Mary's Tower, Monmouth decided to risk everything on the gambler's last throw. A night attack. Monmouth must have been desperate. An experienced general would think long and hard about committing his troops to a, a night march across difficult, unfamiliar territory in order to launch an attack out of the darkness. A general with experienced veteran soldiers to command, soldiers who were gagging to get to grips with the enemy, he might, just might, mull it over for an evening or two before deciding that he'd be better off turning in early with a goblet of spiced wine and the innkeeper's daughter. 
No. Sensible souls left night attacks to daring, dashing young captains with their way to make in the world. Or to desperate men who'd just seen death waiting for them in the fields of Western Zoiland. The King's forces were expecting uh, to be attacked, a frontal attack, and presumably during the day. So the best thing to do was surprise. Uh, surprise along a piece of land where the King's forces least expected them. That is to say, in the dark, across the moor. Now imagine the King's forces, professional soldiers, um, in their tents, uh, all organised and feeling pretty secure because be it, between them and the moor uh, was the Bussex Ring. And they weren't unprotected either because there were cavalry uh, riding across the moor just to make sure there was no surprise. They expected an attack from the road and that's where their guns were pointing. Uh, Monmouth having decided on surprise, waited and left Bridgewater about midnight and came across the moor trying, actually successfully, uh, to avoid the patrols. And they came down to the Langmoor Stone. And somehow the element of surprise was lost because somebody fired a shot across the moor in the dark and in the fog at the Langmoor Stone. <laughs> Monmouth lost the battle because he couldn't surprise the enemy as he'd planned. The idea was that the cavalry should uh, cross the Rhine, uh, go into the tents, uh, just massacre the sleeping troops. It didn't happen, the troops were awake, and Monmouth never got his battle front sorted out because his troops were coming in column. And as soon as they got within firing distance, the King's forces started to fire at them and gradually the King's uh, guns were pulled round to the right direction and the rebels were virtually massacred. The King had clearly been very scared and the way in which he set about uh, teaching the West Country a lesson the bloody assize, as it's called, is a measure of the way in which the government felt that it had nearly fallen, nearly, very nearly lost. Against all the odds stacked against him, Monmouth came so close in those last few hours. Tradesmen from Taunton and Bridgewater, from Bath and Phillips Norton, farm boys from Bovey and Morton Hampstead, Minus and the Mendip, fishermen from Lyme and Beer, all of them stumbling after Monmouth's dream, stumbling along the dusty road to death, while King Monmouth fled from his dream, fled for his life. I only have to close my eyes and I'm back here again. A tired, hungry, terrified boy of 17 the battered old musket on my shoulder and no more than five or six shots in my pouch. I was a fool then. But then I was only one more fool in a whole troop of country clowns. God help us, an army armed with pitchforks instead of pikes. And all of us trying to slip stones silent through the white moonlit moorland mist. All of us, wide-eyed with fear, staring and then starting at every shadow, straining every nerve, every sinew, as we crept closer and closer towards the Bussock Green and the King's soldiers. From somewhere over there, a voice, a Scottish voice, shouted to us out of the darkness, Are you for the King? We shouted back, aye, we're for the king, King Jesus and King Monmouth. And that's when our few hundred muskets opened fire on them. And a few seconds later, the bright darkness grew brighter still with a thousand, two thousand orange-white flickers of flame. 
as they opened fire on us. Ah! I've no way of knowing how long afterwards it was, long after I'd used up all my shot. I was going through some of the bodies on the ground, going through their pockets trying to find cartridge. When somebody came up and shouted, well, it looks like Mom that's left us to settle the bill, lads. And I heard myself saying, aye, well, we all owe God a death. And no one will say Somerset lads don't know how to pay it. So sup up this side of lads. And you know, all around me, people started to laugh. And for the first time in days, I didn't feel alone. And that was the first time I noticed that the sun had come up and that I didn't feel afraid anymore, even though I knew I'd never see it set again. Come on, move along. Get a move on, come on. Get to the church. Get inside. Come on. Come on, go in. in. After the battle, 500 men were pushed and clubbed into the church. Dirty, stumbling, sweat-stained soldiers who'd suddenly been stripped of all their heroic illusions and plunged into the ice-chill reality of defeat. Outside, the slowly strengthening sun trickled down through the dark, dense oaks, the oaks that line the lanes here into the moor and the light splashed brightly on the poor, bedraggled, pathetic figures that choked their lives out at the rope's end as James's vengeful soldiers hauled them up into the trees. Back here in the church, you could have tasted the fear, tasted it as it rolled in bitter, sweet, sick waves up from the muddy, blood-splashed floor. The days of battle were over, and the days of vengeance were just beginning. Some of the men died the vile, eviscerated death of the traitor, and other West Country lads found themselves enduring the long, lingering agony of transportation into slavery. And Monmouth, Monmouth died the most horrible death of all. His head was hacked and butchered from his body by a useless and bungling executioner who took several blows to do the job. And then, and only then, did Monmouth cease his dreaming.